Thanks for coming to Göttingen, Mr. Brownstein. It's great to be here. It's Thank you. It's our pleasure uh, to talk about this very eventful campaign season so far. Um, and so far, it seems like this campaign season is apparently driven by a lot of anger and frustration and dissatisfaction. Where does all the discontent come from? It's a great question. And I think the only way to understand this election is to see it as the culmination of a period of discontent in American life and frustration in American politics. Uh, today, the median income, the income of the average family, is lower than it was when Bill Clinton left office. That's almost unprecedented in American history to go 15 years without an increase in the median income. And that leads to a clear level of economic frustration among many voters that I think has made them open to a wider range of alternatives than we have seen in the past. We're also living through a period of profound demographic change. And the combination of economic frustration and demographic transformation has been a volatile one in any society, I think, throughout human history. But when you add to it that we are, all of this is occurring at a time of intense political polarization, where the political system has had trouble reaching agreement across party lines in a way that allows it to respond to the mounting concerns of much of the electorate. You add all of that up and you have a very volatile environment that I think whose, whose key characteristic in many ways is what we are seeing voters being willing to consider candidates who in the past they probably would not have considered. It's hard to imagine Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders for that matter getting as far as they have 15 years ago, 20 years ago. There, there's a signal there to the more established politicians about what is happening in the country that I think they need to be aware of. So now that you've mentioned Trump and Sanders, um, some observers have drawn parallels between the success uh, of these two candidates, um, well, the relative success, though, in the case of mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders. And there are some ideas of, you know, that their constituencies might partially overlap. What do you think of that? Are there really Sanders voters out there who might support Donald Trump, Sanders not becoming the Democratic nominee, or is this just some fantasy? Well, I think they are more different than, than similar, by far. Not only in terms of their message and... Uh, their agenda, but also their audience. Uh, there is one area of overlap I'll come back to in a minute. Mostly, I think that is overblown. I think the similarity, though, that's important is that, as I said, they are each candidates who I think would have largely been considered outside of the boundaries of a plausible president 15 or 20 years ago. And the fact that between them, they have attracted over 20 million votes uh, for a self-described, you know, septuagenarian socialist on the one hand, Uh, and on the other for a very brash uh, business executive with no previous political experience. I think there's an important lesson in there. Having said that, I think the overlap is limited. Uh, Bernie Sanders voters come in two big pools. One are young people, our millennial generation, people who are roughly 34 and younger, and the other are blue-collar whites. I think some of those blue-collar white, those working-class white voters, he won this week, of course, in West Virginia. He's beaten Hillary Clinton among working-class white voters in every state outside of the South except Ohio. I think some of those voters, in the end, might be attracted to Donald Trump. But the core of the Sanders constituency is the millennial generation, and I think they will be very much at the opposite end. I think they see Trump as the antithesis of what they believe in and what they believe they are bringing to the country, which is a more tolerant, diverse, inclusive society, in many ways they see Trump as an effort to squash that. So I think he will have a lot of trouble with young people, but there will be parts of the blue-collar Sanders side that he may make some inroads with. It's been a tumultuous Republican primary, leaving the party in a state of total disarray. Yeah. Um, would Trump be able to unify at some point the Republican Party? Uh, this is clearly the most tumultuous Republican primary since at least Reagan Ford and probably ever. I mean, the, the way it is, it is ending with these public declarations from leading party figures that they will not support Trump really is unprecedented. You know, people were looking back through American history to find any previous example of a former nominee talking about a future nominee the way Mitt Romney talked about Donald Trump, where he said, you know, he's completely unacceptable as president. And the closest anybody could ever come was Al Smith, who was the Democratic nominee in, eight, in 1928. By 1936, had gone to the right and was condemning Franklin Roosevelt. So there aren't a lot of examples. When the Speaker of our House of Representatives, Paul Ryan, you know, said the other day that he would not support Trump, uh, there was simply, he was not ready to support Trump. There's simply no precedent for that. I mean, the kind of the, the leading elected official in a party pushing to arm's distance the, uh, the, the you know, prospective nominee. Look, What Donald Trump engineered was a revolution from within. Uh, it is a mistake to believe that he won this by 
uh, bringing in, importing, as some conservatives say, importing a new group of voters. If you look at the exit polling that was done, the share of the vote cast by people who identified as Republican in 2016 was essentially no different than it was in 2012. And in every state that he won, except for Missouri, he won most people who identified as Republicans. The idea that he only won because of an influx of non-Republicans is absurd. But what he did do, what he did do, and which I think largely explains what we're seeing now, is he cut the Republican Party along a different line than what we have seen before. He fractured it across, along a different fault. Historically, the division has been ideology and religion. You had a candidate of evangelical Christians and very conservative, you know, kind of vanguard conservatives, and you had a candidate of more center-right, economically focused, somewhat less religiously focused conservatives. Usually, that's the guy who wins, Mitt Romney. John McCain. They beat the other one. They beat the kind of evangelical candidate, Mike Huckabee, Rick Santorum. Those were not the divisions that applied to Trump. Trump ran basically as well among evangelicals as among non-evangelicals. His support didn't differ that much by ideology. Where it differed was blue collar and white collar, college educated and non-college educated. He had support across the party, but the core of his support was the growing number of working class white Republicans. And that group has never before picked the nominee over the opposition of the white collar Republicans. And I think what you're seeing here is all of the difficulty of kind of bringing all of this into harmony and alignment, because what Trump is doing is he is reorienting the Republican Party around a very different set of issues and concerns than it has focused on in the past. So what will happen to the Trump voters after 2016? Will there be some sort of Trump wing or you know, a nationalistic protectionist wing in the Republican Party? Or will they disappear? You've just said they're Republicans anyway. So, um, I think it, to I, I think it is. I think it is a great question because I think Trump. One thing you can say about Trump. Trump. Whatever else you think about him, he has exposed the distance between the agenda of the Republican leadership and the and the priorities of much of its voting base. I mean, the you know the big story, and we'll talk about later. The big story in the Republican Party has been the growth of this working class wing. I mean, what some people call the Sam's Club Republicans after our Walmart in the US, uh, you know, we think of it as a party of rich people. It's not really a party primarily of rich people anymore. It, it, its biggest single group uh, are these working class white voters who have realigned, who are culturally conservative, yes, but economically populist. And what Trump has done is shown that on many key issues, trade in particular, where they're more protectionist than the party, and entitlements, retirement programs for the elderly, where, they're more, where they basically do not want to see the cuts that people like Paul Ryan have been pushing for years, there is a gap. Um, and I don't know how all of this gets put, to get, gets put back together after, because Trump was, in the end, a plurality winner. I mean, he really didn't ever have a consistent majority of the party with him until the very, very last primaries when the whole thing kind of broke open. But he won about 41, 42 percent of the total vote. So, uh, and you have minimal, minimal support for Trumpism among elected officials who see it essentially as a suicide note in a country that is growing more diverse to essentially run as a party dedicated to reversing the demographic changes inexorably remaking America. So I don't think there's any easy answer for where this goes. I, I don't think Trump is, is someone like Howard Dean or Bernie Sanders who's going to try to organize a institutional force in the party, an organization, if he doesn't win the presidency. But you can imagine he's going to be on television and tweeting and doing everything he can to kind of make life miserable for all of those who resisted him uh, this year if he doesn't win. So I think the Republican Party is facing an extended shakeout to try to come to terms what is a more, with what is a more complex coalition than they are used to dealing with. So one last and very yes. obvious question. Who's winning? Um, it is hard to see how Trump can win under current circumstances, right? I mean, he needs something to radically shake up the deck. And the reason is, is because the, the fundamental underlying demographics of the electorate are evolving in a way that has benefited Democrats. Democrats have won the popular vote in five out of six elections. You don't win the popular vote in five out of six elections by accident, just as Republicans didn't in the five out of six from 1968 to 1988. You win the popular vote in five out of six because big blocks of the electorate are aligning with you on a lasting basis that provides a sustained advantage. And in fact, if you look at the key groups in the Democratic coalition, minorities, the millennial generation, and socially liberal white collar whites, they are all growing as a share of the electorate. They will all cast more of the vote in 2016 than they did in 2012. I think if that is true, if the electorate continues to evolve in the way that it has been evolving for the last 
really 40 years, since, since the, let's say 1980, 35 years, Donald Trump cannot win. He cannot squeeze enough margin out of the existing groups. He would have to win almost two-thirds of white voters, given his difficulties among minorities, and that would be very hard for him, given how much resistance he faces among white women. The one way that Donald Trump might be able to find a way to win would be if he can change the composition of the electorate. That's not easy. I mean, the, the, the long-term trend is that the white share of the vote has declined in every election since 1980, except one. But if Trump can find a way to turn out enough disaffected, culturally conservative whites without provoking an equal backlash from all of the young people, socially liberal whites and minorities who reject his vision of America, then he might be able to find a way to squeeze it out. That is very, very difficult to do. Thank you very much, Mr. Brown. Thank you.